Hello, and welcome to Morgan & Teeth Presents. I'm Oliver Morgan, co-founder and director of Morgan & Teeth and your host. And today I'm joined by Christian Stickle to talk about the movement of ownership from private hand to private equity from the perspective of an incoming CEO. Christian has over 18 years international experience working in multinational corporations, including Hewlett Packard and Danaher. He spent over one and a half years living in America and has overseen factories in China. And as well as this, he's had recently four appointments as CEO when they've gone through a transition of ownership. He recently exited Kappa Optronics, a PE-backed manufacturer of high-end vision systems. And in this discussion, he gives some valuable insights into some of the initial challenges CEOs face, such as poor customer retention, poor technical developments and cash flow management. But then some of the importance of many other topics, including managing shareholder expectations, good strategy deployment, of course, the leadership team involved, as well as some low hanging fruit. We we'll hope you enjoy. Christian, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm feeling very honored to being part of this and uh, maybe contributing a little bit to the huge uh, collection of uh, uh, interviews that you have been doing here, which are really interesting. No, I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation. So um, what we're talking about today is uh, um, moving organizations from private hand to private equity. Um, and in particular, given your background and experience, the, uh, um, the opportunities there from a, um, or an incoming CEO. Um, could you maybe set the scene a little bit about uh, what you think some of the, the challenges are for a, a CEO coming into that environment? Yeah, uh, maybe it would be good to, to uh, look at the situation before actually the private equity uh, gets uh, involved and uh, uh, typically what happens or that's actually also my experience is uh, companies in private hands, they have the, the owner possibly for decades, uh, the owner is usually a very strong personality, uh, sometimes it's a group of owners and They've been shaping the company for a long period of time with all their personality, with everything they have. It's their life, basically, that you, you find there. With all goods and bads that, that is involved in here. And um, so when, when the private equity comes in um, and the company is being sold, uh, you, you may have to expect a few things that are quite special challenges here. One is, of course, um, the, the owner uh, is leaving a legacy of styles, of people he selected, of um, methodologies and structures that need to be looked at. And uh, they may sometimes not be uh, to the book of what, what you would expect from larger companies or where you would think best practices uh, uh, are at the moment. Secondly, um, in, if, if you honestly look in those, those situations, the, the, the topic of succession is a very big topic, at least uh, here in Germany, and I believe in uh, many other countries as well. And uh, succession is not about always about finding the right guy to follow up as a successor, but it's also about the owner of letting go and uh, what, what this results in. Sometimes those owners let go quite late in the game. So they they have been dragging a little bit the decision because they it's it's their baby and um, what this leads to is you may find a situation where uh, the company is already suffering from uh, uh, not having dealt with recent changes in the marketplace with new challenges with competitive situations and things like that so there's there's a backlog of things that may not even be visible to the new buyer of the company uh, immediately um, that you as an incoming CEO have to recognize and deal with. Um, and this may go all the way through different uh, phases and topics, uh, starting from customer retention, from business that's stalling, from possibly neg neglecting new technical developments that uh, have been overlooked um, and going all the way down to uh, 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 inventories and, and, and cash management issues which private 
owners sometimes have a very different view about than uh, private equity companies uh, would expect. So you 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 have you have to expect and deal with these kinds of things which may not be visible and not be known at the time of due diligence. Now I was going to say, do you not think are, are these um, not always topics that would typically get picked up in the due diligence phase, and then um, once identified, have the relevant CEO selected accordingly? This is actually, uh, I found in, in several cases, uh, uh, quite a challenge. You have to, to look, I'm, I'm not talking about companies which are more the small and medium sized enterprises, not the big corporations. So usually they're working in, in some kind of niche, niche business, highly specialized, very successful in their niches. But those niches are too small to find real good public market intelligence. So all a potential buyer, an outside investigator uh, may have a secondhand information and some kind of things that, that may lead to conclusions, but they may not be ideally uh, hitting exactly this marketplace or this technology because Public market analysis is uh, far too to coarse for that. Is not not uh, meeting all these details. So it, at the end, uh, I've seen it that uh, in due diligence, it is very difficult from the outside to really look at the at the sustainability uh, of market positions, at the sustainability or the forefront of technological developments inside the company, and so on. It's not about looking at the books and the, and the, the so-called data room, which is, uh, I think, very, very standard. It's more looking behind the scene to the soft factors. It's also looking at the personalities you find there. Uh, I have to say, typically, uh, company owners uh, or founders who've brought the company to a certain size o over time, they all are very good salesmen. So they they. They are used to sell their company uh, and uh, sell it to customers and sell it to buyers. And um, uh, so for them, it may look easy to convince a potential buyer, a private equity company or an investor, investor to, to look at the very bright future. But what I've also seen is that intuitively, those very same uh, owners also fear, feel, uh, they may not be able to formulate, but they, they feel that it's time to leave because there is something coming up, which is uh, uh, possibly creating a difficult time in the company, like a big change in technology. For example, I, I had this case where digitalization uh, of certain uh, electronic circuits were uh, a major topic, uh, obsoleting basically the core competence of the company uh, uh, over time. So. If there's no external market experts who are deep enough into this particular market segment, into this particular uh, uh, technology and uh, niche of the company, it may be difficult for outside uh, uh, persons who are in due diligence to really find all the uh, uh, these details. Right. Okay. So what you're saying is, is oft, often with an in incoming CEO um, into these environments, there are potential pitfalls. Um, that they can come or come up against, and I guess that could lead to um, a misalignment in expectations between shareholders and um, what's actually possible. It it may eventually lead to a let's say a second wake up call. Uh, uh, fact is basically that the, the incoming CEO, in in his first couple of days and months, will have to do a much deeper due diligence from the inside than it was possible from the outside. So he will find some new truths. Uh, he will find some new uh, conclusions about uh, the company. It doesn't always have to be bad surprises, but uh, it, it may eventually be. And the big challenge, obviously, in, in those cases is that uh, 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 private equity has made up an investment plan. They have created their own business plan. Usually this business plan foresees 100% uh, or 50% organic growth within a certain uh, time window plus m a and additions and all these kinds of things and now now the the income the incoming or a new ceo may be the bad messenger who now uh, has to inform uh, 
his shareholders about uh, some hurdles on the way or some unexpected findings. And this certainly is a stretch to, um, uh, to convey. And my personal recommendation and warning really is to not hide it and to uh, uh, trying to be the miracle healer who, who, who deals with it uh, behind the scenes and eliminates all these issues because usually if there are issues, they are too deep to, to uh, re remain unrecognized after time. Okay, so your advice would always be for the CEO to be transparent with the shareholders about the real situation rather than yes. pretending that they can achieve it. Especially at the beginning, my recommendation is, and my personal learning is, uh, uh, be, be upfront, be open, and, and get all the issues on the table and review uh, the business plan together with the shareholders and see what the consequences are. Um, later on, it falls on you as uh, on your performance as as um, a CEO if if you have to deal with it at the beginning. Yeah, there is still this time window where you can possibly modify or discuss a little bit the objectives that you also had to had to sign up uh, you know, in order to get the job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, apart from these potential technology gaps or um, let's say commercial gaps that the um, a CEO may face when, when coming into the situation. Um, what might be some other challenges or, uh, or gaps, maybe the main differences then between the, uh, yeah. the original organization and the, what private equity are moving for? Possibly there is uh, under each stone you turn, you, you may find some things that you need to touch eventually, but uh, I found that one of the most relevant gaps or most relevant issues to deal with is uh, strategy in itself. Um, this, this comes um, down to looking at, again, at the history of those companies and uh, typically those self-made owners, uh, founders of a company with all their pride and all their success over decades to build up a, a respectable company. Um, the, the, there is hardly ever a strategy process or, or an awareness about strategy. Those companies do have a strategy, but this is intuitively followed. It's not formulated. And in some cases, it's not even shared with, uh, with the staff because uh, what you also find in those companies is, is a pretty, many times a top-down culture. So the one person defines and decides most relevant things uh, by himself and delegates basically just the execution of it. So um, you have to be clear that uh, when, when a private equity company gets in, there are different expectations on growth, on value generation than there may have been before. So th that requires different thinking and it also requires putting things on, on the test stand to, to see if, if the company is in, uh, in the right direction, uh, how positioning is. In, in one case, uh, I remember that uh, my predecessor, the, the founder of the company, he proudly told me that his strategy was to have no strategy, but right. rather <laughs> that when, when, when a customer comes with a ref, uh, request and they could solve it, they did. And that was leading to a lot of successful engagements all over the places from, from medical technology to, to uh, aerospace, to automotive, to uh, defense, to whatever, you name it. But uh, it, it was spread over the places and it was not scalable in itself. So uh, th there was really no awareness of strategy in that case. And I found it in, in different cases as well, where um, you had to go back and uh, in, in the first step, just do an as-is analysis, putting things into structures and into words that what they what the company is currently doing. It's not even reviewing or or assessing if that's the right strategy. It's just uh, again getting a snapshot on on how the company is doing at the moment, what they're doing to put words around it. And then in the second step, you can work on it and see and review if if these are all the right things to do and and uh, follow certain schemes. Um, to to come to to a conclusion, what to do for the future then, and what to do different in the future. 
Right. Okay. So once as a CEO, when you're coming in, once you've um, really fully understood the, the current business situation, communicated clearly with um, the shareholders, um, that next phase is, is then really, once you've understood where are we, is defining a clear strategy, I guess, and that, that's an opportunity. How important is it to bring in the entire organisation into that versus just the, the top management or doing it alone as the CEO? I think this is the key uh, uh, for a successful strategy is that uh, the whole company down to the cleaning woman uh, are embracing, are aware of the strategy and embracing the strategy that it's not some some paperwork for investors and, and finance people, that it's, it's really something that is alive inside the company. So you need everybody. And I found that the best really is, uh, especially when you start on a low level with people who are not really experienced in working in, in, in st strategy development, for them it's uh, sometimes uncomfortable and quite new because you are you're move them out of the reactive into some more abstract uh, forward looking um, uh, perspectives. Uh, to do it on, on a step-by-step -step basis and follow a, a certain structure. And uh, here, I really have to say, uh, despite myself smiling over it in previous times, that what, what worked best is you start with the purpose, with, with a very simple statement that, that embraces the whole company and work down through mission and vision, explain what that means, what this is. And let the whole company uh, participate across levels and across functions uh, in in uh, generating this. Of course, you need also external expertise sometimes to really look and and engage uh, on on perspectives, market perspectives, and positioning and things like that. But it to me, it was proving most important to to really have the company engaging in this process because afterwards. It's, it's not the top-down uh, uh, process anymore. Everybody has his own perspective and ambition. And uh, this also leads to a lot more engagement and loyalty uh, of the whole staff if they've been participating, if it's their company, if it's their mission, and not just something that some, some uh, strange people from above have, have uh, put in place. Yeah, I can imagine. Um... It must be a huge challenge because if they've not had a clear strategy before or um, if, if an organization has taken on any bits of business and uh, it must be quite fragmented, um, making that transition, um, there are obviously some clear challenges there. Um, and you've said in, engaging the, the workforce is a, is a key part of that. But how, what process do you, do you go through? How, how do you really decide in an organization um, like this, what to focus on? Well, um, uh, what to focus on, in, sometimes it's, uh, I would recommend to not trying to focus on completely new things that haven't been in the company before. Um, uh, so focusing in most cases means actually limiting or cutting things out uh, uh, to not do anymore in the future. So the big uh, challenge or dilemma uh, is uh, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive to, to teach the whole organization do less to achieve more. So focus your resources, focus your staff, focus your expertise, uh, make clear decisions about what is your in, in internal uh, core competencies and what can be bought in from, from partners or from the outside. And um, I'm usually working from the outside in. So from the customers, from market, looking into the company and at the end, looking really into internal procedures. But um, there's one, one lesson I learned uh, early and it's a very simple uh, lesson actually uh, for success in companies. That is, if, if you don't lose sight of customer benefits and if you don't lose sight on staff development, profit and success will be the uninvested uninvertible um, um, side effects of it. So you don't need to worry about that if you, if you do this well. And so even in strategy development, if you start from the outside in, looking at where you are in the marketplaces, what are the external environmental conditions, 
powering position there and then work your way into the company and and looking at internal strength and uh, at, at your resources at uh, the possibilities and also at uh, the emotional ambitions of people you need some level of passion you need some level of loyalty to to make things successful and if if you find uh, for certain topics that there's a pushback there's reasons for it, even if they cannot explain exactly. And then it's, it, it, it might, may be difficult to push through that. Sometimes it may be necessary, but usually I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, I can, uh, I can imagine. And then I mean, the people element, obviously, in my role is something that I find, um, find particularly interesting and we'll, we'll certainly yeah. move on to that. I think, though, just thinking about that strategy piece still, you um, are talking about potentially turning down business and um, not taking projects, um, which again may also seem counterintuitive. How, how do you get the organization to, to understand um, why that's important? I think once you've formulated your strategy and, uh, and got the, the principal buy-in from, let's say, the majority of staff and from the people uh, who have uh, responsible positions, I think then it, it is very important to always uh, resort back to that, what you formulated in the strategy and every move and everything, because there, there will be seducing requests from customers and opportunities to follow which are deviate, deviating uh, directly from what you defined as your focus and strategy and indeed it takes it takes also courage for the ceo to say no to obvious business at hand because uh, it, it may be the short-term success the short-term income uh, and uh, but it keeps you from following your strategy and developing what you need and what you had in your plans for strategy and this is something that indeed is is a bit counterintuitive where i find uh, what it takes is always bringing it down back to strategies and this is what we decided together this is what we're following now we have decided also to let go of, of different things left and right of that route and uh, and uh, don't don't be too strict but uh, you have to you have to keep the the targets the, the long-term target always in in their minds and remember and uh, and i think it's it's the steady uh working the steady drop that is finally hollowing the stone and uh and getting the whole organization to move into that direction yeah i can imagine as well having a clear purpose mission vision um and having the employees and, and leadership involved in um being part of the, the creation of that um, and having that to fall back on is is extremely important in those situations that might come up. Yeah. Let's move to the staff then. Let's move to, to talking about the, um, the the people element in, in this. W what is important here? I found uh, with, which also was a bit uh, something that I learned over the over the experience uh, having been in that situation in several companies that what you find in in the, the staff uh, in the people actually is reflected mostly also in the CEO in the in the uh, departing CEO and founder who has shaped the company his personality, his way of hiring people, his way of managing people, of controlling people, are have created a certain corporate culture. And uh, th that kind of corporate culture is very, very specific to the person. So uh, for me, it was very useful if, if I had the chance to get to know uh, my predecessor and uh, being able to discuss and work with him. Um, and in a very early stage to really understand uh, also about the mindsets and the way people think and react in the company. It's basically, in some cases, the DNA. And then, of course, uh, as different as these persons are, as different the whole corporate, corporate culture may be, and, and also reacting to a new CEO. Here, I have seen all the, the classical, uh, let's say, pitfalls from that people think finally the, the old man is leaving and now everything's changing to the better 
And uh, so you're confronted with uh, extreme positive expectations that may be very difficult to fulfill, at, at least uh, all at the same time. Those people, they, they were longing for change. They were longing for something unblocking certain things that they're seeing. My, my finding is uh, there's much more intelligence and knowledge, intrinsic wisdom and knowledge in, in people if they are still loyal to the company, if they identify themselves with their workplace. And so on one side, you, you may be confronted with expectations that, that you have to, to moderate and manage. On the other side, I've also seen that, uh, that you, you start lifting the lid of the pot and, and nobody stood up, nobody came and took over the initiative because they were all kind of ducking and still staying in cover because uh, whoever did that before was fired or <laughs> got yeah. into trouble. And, uh, and, and this all goes really back to the personality that was there before and was leading the company before. And, and here, there's no, no general recipe. Uh, you really have to work with the people, listen and, and trying to understand where they come from and, uh, uh, and then take your conclusions about how to, how to change the organization or how to develop the organization. I had a client before, it was another German client actually, and um, they uh, drew a picture of a caged lion. Um, and they said uh, that this was the historical um, version of the organization. And he said, now we've taken the cage away physically, but the cage is still there mentally. And uh, he yeah. said, people still feel like they're living in this cage and uh, that they are restricted. And we're trying to create this autonomy and upwards thinking and uh, proactivity. And he said, it's actually quite a difficult, um, it's, it's all about the people. It's about changing their mindset, yes. changing their perception. So. Um, it yeah. must be an interesting challenge. And it, it, it is. It's, it's very rewarding when, when you're on the way, uh, but it also takes time. Uh, you can't expect this to change overnight or in, in a very short time. And it also depends really on, on also on, on who, who have, have been hired there. I had one case where the change of, of ownership, the change of, of leadership was actually a a big act of liberation and people with when you looked at their written CVs had a had a not really exciting history suddenly uh, bloomed and and uh, came to life and and had uh, very very good developments and 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 performance but I, I also had the exact opposite case where I, I was wondering uh, why they still stood in in, in almost like in stiffness and, and, and not, not daring to do anything. And, and this, this is basically, you, you probably will find out very quickly uh, what, what you have to deal with, but it's, it's very important uh, to, to find out how to develop the, the organization into the next level then. Mm. Whilst we're talking about people, I wanna, I wanna focus a little bit on leadership. Um, and there may not be a right and wrong answer here, but in, in your experience, are the leadership teams required to be successful in private equity owned organizations um, the same as, as in private ones? I think in private equity environments, uh, the expectations are a little bit different than in private organizations in, in several ways. One is uh, the business model of a private equity company is to acquire a company, to develop, to grow a company, uh, mostly also through additions and then to sell a company. Mm. So the, 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 the time window where things have to happen is limited. And sometimes uh, that may not fit with the business model of the company. So when, when the, the investment cycles inside the company are really long, then either you have to, to take all these steps at the very beginning, or you may slip out of the, the investment window of the private equity. Um, I also believe that uh, uh, private equity companies are typically not driven by engineers. And if you look at privately owned companies, you will find that uh, the owners mostly are 
from engineering or from from some kind of more the product or uh, related and not the financial not the financial side but more the product and technology side so um i think it's it's a big change uh, here uh, inside the company to look first of all you have to look for uh, financial transparency much much more you have to to build up a completely different reporting to private equity companies than you would do just for yourself uh, secondly um, of course there's more visibility on financials there's more visibility on on those ebit numbers and um, uh, that that is a different environment and if if you're if if you're working as a ceo in those companies you have to be aware of course that uh, uh, the, the priorities and preferences of pri private equity companies are the financial data they, they they may not be too interested into the strategic uh, movements inside the company they just want to see the returns mm -hmm. and that's different to uh, privately owned companies where it's it's a lot more about strategy about customer success but not not necessarily at immediate return but also more building the long-term future when you talk about financials, I mean, I've had situations of um, um, private family owned companies that um, have been taken over and let's say they have five plants reporting into the owner. The, the individual plant managers have no idea if their plant is profitable or not because uh, yeah. financial data is hidden. So uh, um, that then from a leadership perspective, like there's a huge amount of upskilling to be able to, like you yes. said, report and, and develop. So I guess there's a, a, a balance there. Yeah, and it's also about sharing responsibilities down. So uh, basically, uh, getting the level of responsibility of your direct reports and the people underneath uh, up. So it's not all on the shoulders of the CEO alone, but that that uh, department leader is aware of his own responsibilities and gets also the freedom to to act and move within his responsibilities rather than just executing on commands that come from from above. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very much so. So we've talked about then the um, uh, having the shareholder alignment and the strategy um, and purpose, vision, mission uh, complete, and, and then the, the people on board. Um, are there any low hanging fruits areas where incoming CEOs tend to get some quick wins? Yeah, I've I, I had my let's say my learning about uh, low hanging fruits when I was working with Danaher and uh, the Danaher business system, which I don't know, I believe is quite well known. It's, it's very close to the Toyota production system. And I found in, in almost all cases that low hanging fruit you will always find when you come into a, this kind of uh, situation, transition situation with new ownership. If you look at your operational processes on efficiencies, um, um, basically doing some kind of lean conversion in, in operations. With operations, I mean supply chain, I mean uh, uh, production, logistics, and all these kinds of functions. This is where I typically found uh, the low-hanging fruit and the, the, the quick achievements, the quick wins, uh, freeing up inventory, freeing up cash uh, from inventory, uh, streamlining processes. Like you mentioned before, if there are factories that where uh, nobody knows from each other, there is a huge potential of synergies. Uh, and also looking at um, insourcing, outsourcing uh, type of questions. Uh, uh, I think that this is one of the places where there's also well-developed script books, how to doing that. There's a lot of best practices that you can employ where you can find external help to, to accelerate the process. And this, this is actually something uh, it, it will not save the future of the company, but it actually uh, frees up cash and, and gets a lot of um, uh, operational benefits on the, in the near term and uh, uh, with direct uh, in, in the performance of the company. Yeah, yeah, I can, uh, I can imagine. And um, I think uh, there are so many changes we're talking about here and so many different parties and expectations um and, and it's been driven from 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 the shareholders primarily but can you make these changes too quickly based on your experience 
Uh, I think there's a risk uh, to make changes uh, too quickly before you actually really deeply understand the organization. Um, I can give you an example uh, in, in, in one of, of my companies I took over uh, for an American um, uh, big corporation who just acquired the family owned business in Germany. They came with a 30, 60, 90 day integration plan. And um, I was, luckily enough, I could convince or, or uh, talk them into a one, two, three year uh, integration plan. The first year for, for the really, the, the rough stuff uh, that involved, for example, uh, closing and transferring one factory from Ireland to China and doing other things which have put it, had the potential of being highly disruptive. The second year was, uh, uh, dealing with what you've done in the first year and smoothing the waves and getting everything to work and uh, fine. The third year was the year of the real operational synergies between the, the, the mother house and, and uh, our company. And it was one of the financially most successful integrations uh, they've ever done in Europe. But it, it shows a little bit uh, uh, that sometimes expect expectations from, from investors and what, what is best practice or what is doable uh, uh, diverge. And it, it's a stretch. It, it requires a certain skill to, to manage expectations, to not withhold with some of the unpopular truths, maybe, but still push forward. And at the end, it's the currency a CEO is living on is the confidence and trust shareholders have in him. And this, mm. is, this is the most important to always uh, uh, be sure that you work enough on, on the kind of backup you need from, from your financial uh, resources and the, uh, and the shareholders to move on. It's almost like a tightrope balance between keeping the shareholders yes. happy and keeping the business engaged and, and on board. Yes. And uh, it's not a surprise why so many uh, incumbent CEOs fail initially um, after that it's, transfer of ownership. It's 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 one of the things. Uh, one one private equity uh, manager told me one time, and it was a fairly rough statement. I found he said basically, it almost doesn't matter who you hire as the first CEO after a succession, because you will burn him out anyway. It's the second one that counts at the end. Uh, it, it, it sounds cynical, uh, but it highlights certainly uh, the level of challenges a CEO in, in that kind of transition situation is facing. Because at the end, my experience was that there's almost no stone being unturned uh, uh, after a while. The, the major question is where do you start and what second and third in, in the role? Yeah, absolutely. And based on your experience, of, um... Uh, you talk about where to start and how to accelerate that pace of change and, and keep people on board. Have you got any tips that you might share um, to others in your situation that, that you found uh, beneficial? Well, I, I don't believe that there is one one major recipe. Uh, uh, the first, uh, it, it, it sounds uh, very, very simple, but uh, two ears, one mouth is, is always good. Uh, listen more than you speak uh, and try to understand um, the first impression sometimes is not the, the true impression. Uh, there is uh, behind the surface, there is a lot more to discover and to understand before you really can take decisions that have consequences. Um, I also find that uh, it's, it's always about people. It's, uh, it's everything, uh, the relation to customers, uh, the, the internal performance, the internal efficiency. It's all about how people communicate about how how things work between people inside the company. Uh, here, typically, I found, for example, that uh, the biggest loss of efficiency, the biggest loss of quality and information is not within one department, one, one branch of the company. It's on the, on the interface front between two departments, between two functions where things get lost. So it's not necessarily within the development department, but it's how development department deals with, let's say, supply chain or how product management is dealing with sales on one side or with uh, development on the other side, where things get lost, where, where uh, uh, things have to be dealt with and, and fixed at the end. I 
do see a lot of siloed organizations, yeah. um, especially in, in family owned businesses. Um, in, in private equity, is it really po- uh, beneficial to break down those silos? Um, if we're talking about the, the, the deal cycles um, the, in terms of timeframes? Uh, it's it's a very good question, and I'm afraid I don't have one smart answer to that because it, it depends on so many things. I myself, I'm not the complete uh, proponent or friend of matrix organizations. Matrix organizations are usually a, a compromise where you don't have critical mass to have everything everywhere. Uh, so uh, sharing resources uh, like in a matrix uh, may be the right thing to do. However, again, it's counterintuitive. It's difficult to implement because it, it requires a change of behavior of people and uh, a change also that it requires the acceptance of ambiguity. So you may have two bosses. Uh, those two bosses may not pull in the same direction sometimes. And you, you have to deal with those situations and you have to, to get the whole organization resilient to, to this kind of field of tension. Um, so, uh, silos need to be broken, yes. Uh, the question is, uh, how can you do it? And it, it depends on the size of the company, the size of the of, of the departments or the, the areas inside the company. Uh, so it's, uh, at the end, it's really about uh, the, the, the analog behavior between people that need to be changed. And here again, I'm, I'm coming back to strategy. If you have a strategy, if you have a mission and vision that everybody's embracing, it's it's actually the soil that things can grow on because uh, if you make it always uh, getting back into their awareness why they're doing things and what the, the ultimate purpose is, it, it's much easier to, to ask things that may have been counterintuitive before or not in the habits of people before. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've touched on it as well when, when we talked about the, um, the, the top-down approach, really hierarchical and, yeah. and, and, and flattening hierarchies. I think um, in the future, we'll see a lot of convergence and, and blurred lines between functions in an organization. And I think yeah. that's a positive thing. I think the um, more collaboration and, like you said, communication and um, I, th- I think yes. ultimately fewer siloed functions is, is what we'll see in the future. Yeah, the, 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 the best practices of, of agile uh, developments and so help in that because these are dynamic teams that are keeping recon, being reconfigured uh, based on situations and phases of projects and so on. This certainly will help also to create more flexibility and less rigidness in organizations that you still may have. Absolutely. And we've still got a long way to go, especially in the uh, some of the industrial yeah. sector and uh, um, a large, larger life science businesses I've seen. Yes. But, uh, it's a huge opportunity there. It is, and it's it's also it's I've I've found it always rewarding and fun to seeing how organizations can change over time. And uh, to me, in uh, uh, sometimes it it feels when you're right in the middle of the situation, down to your elbows in some some daily issues. You, you, you may get uh, frustrated and feel that, uh, well, things are not moving, things are, are slow, it's, it's tough, it's, it's kind of like glue. But when you, after a while, look back, then uh, my experience was, I was always surprised how much has actually been achieved in a fairly over, overseeable time and uh, how things have been developing. And, and uh, when I even look back now in those companies that I worked before, and see that uh, what we did at that time was really uh, something that still uh, pays uh, in, in, into the existence of the company today. So uh, uh, really sustainable uh, decisions and developments at that time. Yeah, I can imagine. I was, I was thinking that we're, we're covering all of the uh, the challenges and some of the obstacles that, that might be uh, be faced, but, but ultimately there's the, the rewards um, thinking like, why would anybody want to, to do this? But you, you just highlighted nicely. That actually, there is so much um, that you can achieve in, in such yeah. a situation. It is. And it's, it's also seeing how people develop. Uh, this is something that I personally is, is uh, filling me with pride when I, when I really see that people 
who actually have been growing beyond what they ever imagined uh, they could do by themselves and, um, and who, are, who bought into this also and not just uh, going with the flow but really took on the challenges and, uh, and grew beyond what they thought they are. And, that's, and, and that applies to organizations sometimes as well. Yeah, I, absolutely, I can imagine. Christian, thank you so much for this discussion today. It's um, been really, really interesting. And I think, especially with coronavirus, uh, um, although we've got vaccines in the uh, um, uh, in the future, there's still going to be so many companies that are going through this change of ownership, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. So it's a particularly interesting. Are, are there maybe some key takeaways you can share with us that um, our viewers and listeners should, should keep in mind? Well, um i think number one is it's always about the people and so it's it's the people inside the company it's also the people pre previously owning the company and obviously the people owning the company right now it's 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 about them it's about the potential expectations and everything you, you need to keep in balance and manage there and and find your way to uh to to have a successful development uh, uh and and evolution of a company um, it's, it, it involves culture change and culture doesn't work without people buying in and people changing their behavior. Yeah. And, um, so, so that's, that's the first, the second really would be expect the unexpected. When you start in a company, it may look completely different from the outside than when you're in, you will find things you, you, you may find positive surprises. You will find things that, uh, you can expect trouble that you haven't seen from the outside, that nobody has seen from the outside, uh, that hasn't even been in their awareness before. Um, so uh, you have to to deal with that and, and again, get into expectation management uh, here. And the third is, uh, which may make it a little bit easier if you look at the history of the company and the personality of the previous owner, if it's a classical succession, if it's a secondary buyout from one PE to another, uh, things look very different. But uh, if it's a classical succession where you, you had a company owner, possibly uh, founding the company, creating the company, and, and then uh, running the company and, and growing it uh, for the last couple of decades, then you can expect to, to read from his personality a lot from what you can expect inside the company. And it, it helps to understand where people are and what, what is necessary to to do to move things uh, inside the company. These, these are basically the three things and then the, all the rest is very individual. I mean, every company is different and every situation is different. So it's a big learning from, from almost ground zero every time again. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, that's something that, that I'll take away is sometimes it helps to look back a little bit at the, the past owner in order to be successful moving forward. Um, so yeah. uh, appreciate that insight. Thank you so much again. Uh, for your My time pleasure. Christian. My pleasure. Thank you.